Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. The early days of 1968 brought North Korea into the world's headlines. Not only did Pyongyang send clandestine forces in an attempt to assassinate the South Korean president in his residence, but North Korea also attacked and captured the American ship USS Pueblo in international waters. One of the crew members died, the other 82 were imprisoned and tortured for 11 months, and released only after the government admitted that the ship was spying on North Korea. To hear about the historical and political context of this story, as well as about the details of the USS Pueblo's capture and the fate of its crew, we spoke to Professor Mitchell Lerner. In particular, he told us about the questionable suitability of the ship for its mission, and the flawed risk analysis carried out by the American government, which cast this incident as an avoidable tragedy. Professor Mitchell Lerner is Associate Professor at the Department of History at The Ohio State University, as well as Director of the school's Institute for Korean Studies. Aside from numerous academic articles, he wrote the book The Pueblo Incident, A Spy Ship and the Failure of American Foreign Policy, which was published in 2002. Professor Lerner received his PhD in History from the University of Texas at Austin. Professor Mitch Lerner, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you for having me. Today we would like to talk to you about the USS Pueblo. But first of all, how did you become interested in this topic? Well, I wish I had a more exciting story than I do. Um, I'd love to be able to say I had like an uncle on the ship or something, and I don't. I was actually a graduate student at the University of Texas to study U.S. East Asian relations, but I was specifically going to focus on the Vietnam War. But it turned out in my Ph.D. program, I learned that everyone who writes about U.S. foreign policy towards Asia was writing about the Vietnam War, so I looked for something more exciting. Because the LBJ Presidential Library is down there in Austin, I had got to know the archivists, and one of them introduced me to one of the archivists for the Foreign Relations of the U.S. series, which is this great State Department series of declassified documents, and they let me know that they were preparing, they were about to release a volume on U.S.-Korean relations from 1964 to 68, and there was all sorts of exciting material in there, particularly about the capture of this American spy ship. So... I thought if I had the opportunity to be the first one to look at all of these declassified materials, and it sounded like a topic that would be interesting. So I jumped on board. I spent three or four months at the National Archives in College Park, Maryland, going through all these new materials, and that became the basis for my first book. For listeners unfamiliar with the topic, could you describe in a few short sentences what the USS Pueblo, an American ship after all, has to do with the Korean Peninsula? Well, very briefly, the USS Pueblo was an American spy ship operating as part of Operation Click Beetle that in January 1968 was in the Sea of Japan, uh, operating off the coast of North Korea when it was attacked and captured by North Korean forces. The crewmen were held prisoner for almost a year, and eventually they were released, although the ship remains a tourist attraction in North Korea. On April 16th, 1944, the ship now known as the USS Pueblo was launched under a different name, and as a freight and passenger ship. What were his first assignments? It's actually pretty unexciting. Um, The ship that eventually became the USS Pueblo went through a number of different names, starting as FP-344, and it was really just a general all-purpose supply vehicle for World War II supplies. Um, It had a pretty unexciting and unglamorous career, and then was retired into mothballs for what was expected to be the end of her life until uh, naval intelligence came calling. You trace the history of the USS Pueblo to a secret program to outfit and operate a fleet of intelligence collection ships. Could you tell us more about this program? In the early 1960s, the American intelligence community decided that one of the ways it would best be able to cover its gaps in intelligence collection and do it relatively cheaply was to convert these small, dilapidated old cargo carriers into mobile espionage devices. And they would take these old ships that would appear so small and and usually unarmed and run down that they couldn't possibly be a threat to anyone. They would convert them for electronic intelligence interception missions. And they would pull them out of mothballs and shape them up and add a special room, special operations department room, with all kinds of sophisticated electronic interception equipment, and then it would dispatch them off the coasts of all sorts of potential target nations to record everything from radar and sonar signals and phone communications and everything else. The program actually started uh, in the early 1960s in response to the Soviets, who were doing it against the United States first. 
Um, and because the convention was that although the Americans would protest the operation of these Soviet ships along the American coast, they never thought it was important enough to merit a major confrontation. And so assuming that other nations would respond the same way as the United States did to these Soviet ships, the American intelligence community started uh, Operation Click Beetle, where they converted these old auxiliary cargo ships into these intelligence vessels. Um, there was a little bit of a tug of war between Naval Intelligence and the National Security Agency about who would actually control them. And in the end, they worked out sort of a joint command where the ships would operate largely under the control of Naval Intelligence, but the NSA would task them with a couple specific operations as well. Um, and off they went into the East Sea to spy on Japan, China, Korea, the Soviet Union, and more. Why was the FB-344, compared to other ships converted for this purpose, a relatively small ship selected for this program? The point of these operations was to appear as unthreatening as possible. And so it was the Navy's preference to take ships that were old and falling apart, in some cases barely seaworthy, and convert them cheaply and quickly and send them out for operations. The general idea was that anything that could um, represent a threat might become more provocative than the United States wanted. And particularly as the Vietnam War was escalating and the United States didn't want to get involved anywhere else, this seemed like the safest and most basic way to go about it. You wrote of the conversion, and I quote, that the end result was one of the omnipresent realities of the Pueblo's conversion. Those who paid attention to the ship could not know anything about it, while those clear to know about it did not pay any attention. Could you tell us more about the conversion of the FB-344 into the USS Pueblo? The conversion of the ship is really an amazing and somewhat disastrous story. The reality is that the mission was classified so top secret that the people actually doing the physical aspects of the conversion couldn't be told what the ship's operations were. In fact, there's all sorts of stories about local operatives working on the ship and preparing it for things that it was never going to be required to do simply because no one bothered to tell them otherwise. And yet at the same time, the few people at the top of the chain of command who actually knew what was happening with these ships didn't pay much attention. In their mind, the fact that the Soviets ran these operations against the United States and the United States never responded virtually ensured their security. So in their eyes, this was a very low-level conversion process. The reality really is that the things that were necessary for the Pueblo were never paid attention to. It was assumed that the ship would be safe because it was going to operate by itself in international waters, and no one would find that provocative. And so everything from self-destruct systems to communications gears to um, self-defense equipment, to the crew's ability in language and technology and everything else that was necessary for the ship's operations were virtually overlooked. It also came up against the Secretary of Defense budget constraints. So the amount of money that was budgeted for the conversion is cut in half and then cut again. And much of the money that was spent was completely wasted as they were spent on things that might be necessary for a larger destroyer operating in this region, but was pretty irrelevant to the notion of what the Pueblo and its sister ships were prepared for. In the end, the few officers of the ship who actually knew what the ship was being prepared for had to sit and watch helplessly as money was spent on things they couldn't possibly use, and yet there was nothing they could do about it because the people that they were working with weren't cleared to know what exactly they were supposed to be doing. By the time the conversion process finished, was the USS Pueblo suitably equipped for its mission? The Pueblo departed for its mission completely unprepared. The stories are amusing, if not somewhat horrifying. There was, for example, about three months before the ship's departure, they did their in-serve training, their inspection and survey team. It was a three-day series of drills in which the Pueblo was tested for virtually everything. Uh, and the testing revealed, I think, 480 deficiencies, a number of which, I think 70 or 80 of them, were ruled that they had to all be fixed before the ship left port, period. And yet most of them weren't fixed. Uh, most notable was probably the steering engine, which failed all the time, leaving the ship struggling in the ocean. In fact, on their first day of actual testing, they went out into the Pacific and made it out for less than 15, 20 minutes before the steering engine failed and they had to be towed in by tug. Even just a few weeks before their departure, and their, as they traveled from Pearl Harbor off to Japan before their first mission actually began, the steering engine failed constantly, leaving them um, unable to navigate. Their communication systems were virtually useless. They had, in theory, all sorts of great communication devices, except they could never connect them with the port in Kamisea, Japan, which they needed to as their home base. They had virtually no weapons. Their Loran and radar systems failed. It was simply a disaster of unbelievable proportions, and everybody on board knew it, 
But the superiors, the higher-ups, really didn't care because all they knew was that this ship was likely to be safe because other nations ran these sorts of operations. So nobody really cared when the captain complained about all these malfunctions. We haven't mentioned the crew yet. Who were they, and did they have any experience for this kind of missions? The crew consisted of 83 people. Very few of them had relevant training or background. Most notable were the two translators. When they found out that they were going to be operating off the coast of North Korea, the officers sought Korean translators, obviously. They were assigned two Marines, Hammond and Chika, if I remember their names correctly, who were the only two people on board with any experience in Korean, except it turned out their entire Korean training consisted of a nine-month training course at one of the Naval Language Institutes in California, and that had been years ago. So neither of them really spoke more than a word or two, and it really compromised the mission because they were able to intercept all sorts of North Korean communications, but they couldn't translate them fast enough to know what was happening. It was similar with the rest of the crew. A few had had, many had naval experience, but they didn't have much intelligence background. The commander, Pete Booker, this was his first command, and he had spent very little time in the East Sea. There was a pretty poor relationship between Booker and his first in command, and then almost no communication between them and the head of the intelligence compartment. So the crew really had no idea what they were facing. They were poorly trained. In fact, in their training missions, the few that were allowed to operate the guns could barely hit a target. Nevertheless, without the ability to intercept the language or hit a target or communicate with their protective forces, they were sent off to the coast of North Korea anyway. Moving on to the mission of the USS Pueblo itself, this so-called Operation Click Beetle was judged as involving minimal risk. First of all, what did the mission consist of? The mission was deemed a, a minimal risk operation. The Pueblo was sent into the East Sea to operate off primarily off four North Korean cities. It was uh, Wonsan and Chongjin, Songjin, and Mando, if I remember correctly, for roughly two weeks. And although there's still some debate about the real purpose of the mission, it appears that at least part of it was that there were rumors of a new North Korean sub-design that was perhaps stationed at uh, Mando, as well as there's some hypothesis that they were supposed to keep an eye on the Soviet fleet at Vladivostok, where there was rumors of an impending missile test. So although I'm not sure exactly what the primary purpose was, in the end, the Pueblo was ordered into the East Sea to operate in some pretty dangerous waters. Who conducted this risk assessment, and why did they believe it only involved minimal risk? The mission risk assessment was just about the biggest failure of this whole operation. The general orders came from the top, from the commander-in-chief of the Pacific Fleet, who selected the targets and then ordered lower agencies to assess the risk. So that, in the beginning, predisposes these lower-ranked agencies to find them to be minimal risk because they didn't want to appear to be countermanding their superior officers. They studied all sorts of factors to determine whether or not anything was minimal risk. But the reality is any sort of objective analysis indicates that they didn't spend much time focusing on the critical elements. They assessed everything from possible support forces to the likely response of the target nation to the necessity of the intelligence that they were hoping to collect. But the reality is there hadn't been a click beetle operation off the coast of North Korea in over a year. The couple that were there had been harassed pretty severely, and even beyond that, There had been increasing tension in North Korea at the time anyway, and yet the people who assessed this operation decided that simply because the ship was going to be operating off a communist state and the Soviets had run these missions off the United States coast and the United States had never responded, there was no likelihood that the target nation would respond, and all of the obvious warning signs were ignored, and the report was sent back up the chain of command, assessing it as a minimal risk operation. Now, along the way, all the other levels of the chain of command were supposed to do an independent risk. That ranged from uh, Commander-in-Chief Pacific Forces to Commander-in-Chief of, uh, Naval Operations up to the CIA and the NSA and the 303 Committee, which was the top secret committee that was supposed to approve monthly all of the American intelligence missions. But the reality is most of them did their analysis in 24, 48 hours and without paying much attention to the specific details of the operation. The reality is how anybody could look at the plan to run an intelligence collection mission off the coast of North Korea at a time in early 1968 where Korea was exploding with tension and recognizing that there weren't many support forces that could be there uh, in the immediate vicinity in case of quick problem and still come up with a minimal risk assessment really defies logic. 
was this just a single flawed assessment or is it representative of a bigger trend? Yeah, I think the problem is actually really reflective of one of the fundamental failures of American foreign policy in the Cold War. And that was the tendency to see the communist bloc states as this united monolith. And because China or the Soviet Union might do something, that meant all the other communist states just danced to their tune. And it represented a real failure to consider the uh, imperatives that were actually driving North Korean foreign policy. And I think on a large level, this is kind of the story of the Cold War. And, and the Vietnam War stands as a classic example, right? We look at the United States responding to the insurgency in Vietnam and seeing it as part of a global communist struggle rather than seeing it as a nationalist movement inside Vietnam. And I think Korea is sort of the same thing. I think what drives North Korean foreign policy in this event, as well as many of its other foreign policy crises, are indigenous forces, domestic factors that were unique to North Korea and that reflect Korean value and Korean history and Korean heritage. And yet, in the eyes of the United States, all they needed to know was that the Soviet Union was the puppet master and North Korea was the puppet. And so, since these ships were safe if they operated around the Soviet Union, then they would be safe operating around North Korea because there was no need to fundamentally distinguish what was going on inside North Korea and what indigenous forces inside North Korea actually mattered. Could you give us a brief overview of the course of the mission? Well, the Pueblo left port in Japan in January of 1968. Um, it was supposed to operate off these four North Korean port cities. Things were pretty quiet for the first week or so. There wasn't much traffic. It's January. The weather is terrible. They're not intercepting very much, and the stuff that they can intercept, uh, their language expertise is so poor that they're not really able to translate it. On, I think it's January 21st, they bump into their first North Korean ship, a North Korean torpedo boat that just flies right by. There's no indication as to whether or not they had been seen, but they at least were started to be worried about it, and the captain ordered a situation report to be prepared and sent back to Washington so naval authorities would know that they had at least been spotted, but because of the communication problems, they were unable to send that message. The next day, they are surrounded very briefly by two North Korean ships, who approach the Pueblo, run a few laps around it, withdraw a little bit, clearly looking at it, come back and operate a few more laps. They send messages, we now know from South Korean intelligence, they send messages back to headquarters, essentially declaring that they have spotted this ship, they recognized it as an American ship, the Pueblo didn't have any markings on it to indicate that it was an American, so the Captain Pete Booker thought they would be safe, but the North Koreans recognized it as an American ship, radioed back to headquarters, and then shot back to port. Next morning, January 23rd, the Pueblo was operating uh, in the East Sea when it was approached by a series of North Korean torpedo boats and patrol boats, including a, a couple of sub chasers. They surrounded the ship, ordered the Pueblo to surrender. Captain Booker, who was had been warned to actually expect this sort of harassment, and earlier ships, earlier ships in the Click Beetle program had been harassed along these lines. Didn't panic. He indicated that they were just testing uh, the waters of the area, that they were an oceanographic ship, and started headed towards open sea. The North Korean ships followed, surrounded them, and although it's a long and complicated story, the short version is that they opened fire. The Pueblo was in the middle of trying to escape. In fact, at one point, Commander Booker had, was stalling for time, hoping that there would be American rescue forces coming. But in the end, he surrendered the ship. They were ordered to follow the North Korean vessels into port, which he did, but still stalling for time, he decided he would feign mechanical breakdown and threw the ship out of gear. The North Koreans turned and opened fire, really decimated the ship. They killed one American sailor and wounded a handful of others. At that point, Commander Booker, recognizing that their efforts to communicate with naval authorities were not amounting to much, that they were completely outgunned, that their self-defense system was no match for the North Koreans, and stalling for time so that they could destroy some of the classified materials on the ship, surrenders, began following the North Korean vessels into port. Eventually, the North Koreans actually stopped them, boarded the ship, tied up the men and held them prisoner and towed it into Wonsan Harbor, North Korea. You mentioned they tried to contact and reach out for help, but none came. Was that just a technical failure from the ship or was there simply no help sent? The fundamental embodiment of the failure of planning plays out in the inability to get support forces there on time. The Pueblo was just assumed by its higher-up authorities that it was going to be safe, and so no one thought to put support forces on alert. The reality is there were all sorts of 
support forces in the area, whether they were in Japan or South Korea or even the USS Enterprise, which was operating just a couple hours from where the Pueblo was captured. Had anyone informed these bases or the Enterprise itself that the Pueblo was in the area running a dangerous mission, they would have had support forces on alert, and yet they weren't anywhere. And it's really an incredible series of events where the Pueblo is sending these top-secret messages begging for help, and local forces are scrambling, but in some cases they have the wrong bomb cables attached to the planes. In other places, planes were out on training missions, and by the time they could round up pilots and fuel the jets, it was going to be too late. The Enterprise was operating in the area and yet had never even heard of the Pueblo. Had they been alerted, they could have had planes there probably in 90 minutes, which might have been able to make a difference. But in the end, through an incredible series of failures that reflected the American inability to recognize that a ship operating off North Korea would not be as safe as a ship operating off the Soviet Union, it meant that the Pueblo's messages were all for naught uh, and that it was with incredible frustration as American um, Navy personnel in particular were listening to the attacks and trying to get help in the air, but no one was on alert and so no one was ready to get there in time. You mentioned that Booker tried to stall for some time and destroy incriminating evidences. Was it successful? The One of the great losses of the Pueblo was the intelligence material that was actually on the ship. It was another incredible failure of the American Navy. The ship wasn't prepared with any serious self-destruct device. Any ship with the top secret devices and paperwork that the Pueblo had should have been so prepared, but they weren't because the Navy assumed that they would be safe. Commander Booker had kicked and screamed. They tried to get all sorts of self-destruct devices, but the Navy never thought it was necessary. So when the attack happened, the men were reduced to trying to destroy machinery, top secret machinery encased in steel by hitting it with sledgehammers and fire axes. They had literally thousands of pages of classified documents, but almost no incineration system. The one that they had was a hand-fed, antiquated model that could burn a few pages per minute, but the pages had to be shredded first, and they had only one really small paper shredding machine. So in the end, although we, we still argue a little bit, I guess, about the severity of the loss, everyone agrees that it was overwhelming. It ranges from literally thousands of pages of papers detailing everything from American intelligence requirements and targets in the area to the operating manuals for the KW7 code radio and the uh, 390A code radio and some of the other top secret machinery to the machinery itself. There's also the fact that the ship in its two weeks or so of operation, had collected thousands of pages of material, which now the North Koreans would have, knowing what information the United States had. Um, and although we don't know with 100% certainty, we assume that it's no coincidence that the day after the seizure, a plane departed from Pyongyang from Moscow carrying all sorts of boxes of material and machinery that we assume to be the, the surviving gear of the USS Pueblo. And the National Security Agency actually intercepted a number of communications from Pyongyang to Moscow, sending over all sorts of classified American intelligence materials. Going back to the crew of the ship, how were they treated once captured? Pueblo crew was captured, dragged into Ansan Harbor, and they spent about 11 months, almost a year, in North Korean prison camps. As you can imagine, it's not a lot of places worse than a North Korean prison camp. For the first couple months, they were tortured pretty regularly, although they were tortured not so much to extract information as much as they were to gain apologies and confessions that could be used for North Korean propaganda. The torture was actually pretty basic. They clearly didn't have the sophisticated machinery that, say, the United States or the Soviets would have had. So it consisted of things like being beaten with wooden blocks um, or being forced to crawl on the floor on broken glass or, or, or things like that. Nevertheless, it was pretty effective. This, along with the lack of food and heat and everything else, uh, made it a pretty miserable experience. Most of the men broke down within a week or two and provided the confessions that the North Koreans had requested. Over the course of the next few months, things improved, although they would get better and worse as time went on, depending on certain external circumstances. But by and large, the men suffered physical hardships and handicaps as a result of their imprisonment. That left many of them, even once they were released to the United States a year later, many of them never fully recovered. At the time, President Lyndon Johnson was in power. How did he and his administration handle the situation? Well, the Johnson administration was, was stunned when news reached them. No one had ever considered the possibility that North Korea might attack this American ship. Um, in the immediate aftermath for a few days, the administration, particularly the military leadership, is really quite aggressive and begins planning some sort of retaliation, perhaps a rescue mission. But there is much, a great outpouring of bellicosity as the American people and the American government really wants revenge. 
But calmer heads quickly prevail. And the reality is there was no military operation that was going to save the 83 captured crewmen. And so the Johnson administration, particularly with the war already raging in Vietnam, unwilling to get the United States caught in another major war in East Asia, quickly recognized that their diplomatic options were limited. And so they put the calls for military response on hold and sought diplomatic solutions. Now, in their immediate response, which reflected this, again, this larger failure to understand what had really happened, they reached out to the international community. So they reached out to the Soviet Union, and to the extent that they could, they reached out to China. And they reached out to the United Nations and the World Court and the International Red Cross and other international groups that they thought might be able to exert some pressure on North Korea. Um, And it took a few weeks for them to realize that North Korea maybe didn't succumb to the pressure that they thought, even pressure from their communist bloc allies, because quickly the Johnson administration recognized that the Soviets really hadn't been behind this um, and were limited in what they could do. So over the course of the next few weeks, the Johnson administration accepted the idea that the way to resolve the problem was to meet North Korean diplomats face to face at what turned out to be a a site of the North Korean choosing, and that was the Military Armistice Commission in Panmunjom. And so for the next 10 or 11 months, negotiations for the release of the Pueblo took place in that format. Could you tell us more about the negotiation between North Korea and the U.S.? Negotiations drag on at the Military Armistice Commission, and the North Koreans, as early as February, submitted the demand that they wanted to release the men. They wanted what the U.S. would soon call the three A's, which was apologize, admit, and assure, and that meant apologize for having violated North Korean waters, admit that they had done this as part of a spy operation, and assure the North Koreans that they would never do so again. The United States sought all sorts of possible solutions except that including things like asking the North Koreans to turn the men over to a neutral nation and then hold an investigation. And if the neutral nation would conclude that the United States had done these things, then the United States would apologize. They talked about various other public statements, but the North Koreans would never accept anything. The United States sought to put pressure on the North Koreans, working in some cases even with the Soviets, as well as all sorts of other international agencies, to try to threaten the North Koreans or at least force them to back down from the three A's demand, but they were unable to do so. In fact, we know now from records from the Soviet Union the extent to which the communist bloc states were pretty unhappy with North Korea for this. The Soviets made it pretty clear from the beginning to the United States that they weren't part of this, and we now know from their own records that they had some pretty hostile communications with the North Koreans, that by February, certainly March and April, the Soviet government was pretty blunt with the North Korean ambassador and other North Korean officials that they needed to resolve this issue, and that the Soviets weren't willing to support them and were bitter that they had been dragged into this problem. And yet the reality is... For the next 11 months, no one could exert pressure on the North Koreans to make them um, accept anything other than the three A's demand. And so the negotiations really by the summer of 68 got stuck on that hangar. Why wasn't the U.S. willing to follow the triple A demands? They seem fairly low cost. Well, there was a lot of objections within the United States to admitting, apologizing, and assuring. Um, One, of course, was that the Pueblo was not actually caught inside North Korean territorial waters. Now, there's very little doubt that the Pueblo had, in fact, violated North Korean waters over the course of its mission. But at the time the North Koreans actually captured the ship, it was well in international waters. And the North Koreans designed some pretty blatant propaganda efforts where they doctored American naval charts that were captured on the ship to suggest that the United States had, in fact, intruded. But the reality was they had not. Uh, And so there was a sense in the United States that this was really an absurd demand. Beyond that, of course, let's remember that 1968 is an election year. The Johnson administration is certainly worried about losing face and being humiliated publicly by offering this sort of apology. And beyond that, I think the shock that the North Koreans had captured the ship when there was all sorts of precedent for these ships to be operating in those territorial waters meant that in the United States' eyes, to acknowledge that this was somehow wrong would compromise all sorts of efforts around the globe. Why did North Korea take the risk of angering the United States? There are all sorts of hypotheses about that, and we who have really studied this period of the late 1960s in North Korea have argued about this a little bit, and so there's a lot of possible explanations. One, some have argued that it was an attempt by the North to 
focus public attention away from the January 21st, 1968 assassination attempt of South Korean President Park Chung-hee in the Blue House. And that had occurred just a couple days before the seizure of the Pueblo, and it created a bit of an uproar internationally, and particularly for Kim Il-sung at home. And so there are some who have argued that in an attempt to sort of cover up for his failures in that assassination attempt, Kim ordered this as a sign of success and a reflection of his own strength in foreign policy. Others have argued that he's influenced by the growing Vietnam War, that he thinks that the United States is so distracted by Vietnam, it won't retaliate, it won't respond, and that'll give him a free hand. Others have argued that he recognized that perhaps the tide of progress was going against him in the North, that the growth of the South Korean economy and the stabilization of the South Korean government had put the South in the driver's seat. And this was an effort to rally people in the communist bloc behind him and maybe drive a wedge between the United States and South Korea. Others have argued that in the middle of the chaos of the Cultural Revolution in China, Kim Il-sung saw an opening for him to emerge as the dominant political figure in the communist bloc and and maybe a leader of the third world communist bloc nations. And so this was his attempt to establish his bona fides and do something really provocative and aggressive at a time when, because of Vietnam, he felt safe that he could get away with it. Others, including myself, look more to domestic factors in the North. I, I have argued that Things were internally more unstable for North Korea, for Kim Il-sung in 67, 68, than they had been in a long time. And there was a series of purges within the North and some problems economically and politically with China and the Soviet Union that have put him in a bit of a weaker position. And I think that this was perhaps an effort to rally the people. It gives him a, a year of great propaganda because he's constantly rallying the people against the American enemy who is no doubt going to come and be launching an attack as well as it's a sign of personal strength for him that he can relate to the Korean people, to the North Korean people, um, as both an explanation for the shortcomings and the problems within North Korean society and an example of his own strength and determination in international affairs. So we're not exactly sure. I think the answer probably lies in a combination of all of those factors. But in the end, I think the most important factors are those that are directly connected to North Korea rather than those who put this in some sort of international communist conspiracy theory, as the Johnson administration did, as it assumed this had to be tied to the Soviet Union or tied to the Vietnam War, and didn't really spend a lot of time analyzing what unique factors inside North Korea might be at work here. As you mentioned, the negotiations for the release of the crew took place in Panmunjom, in the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. How did the South Korean government, and especially Park Chung-hee, react to all these events? One of the great complicating factors for the Johnson administration's efforts was actually South Korea and Park Chung-hee. When the South Korean government found out that the United States was willing to negotiate, they were furious. Now, I, I suspect that they maybe weren't as furious as they claimed, and that in reality they saw this as an effort to obtain greater economic and military assistance from the United States. Understand that between 1960 and 1965, American military and economic assistance to South Korea was virtually cut in half. And there was even talk of more. In fact, uh, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara had argued a number of times that the United States was dramatically overinsured in South Korea and that to save money, we should recall American forces and cut back American spending. The thing that sort of reversed this trend was the expansion of the Vietnam War and Lyndon Johnson's desperate need to portray this to an American audience as part of an international effort, not simply an American effort. And so LBJ put out a call to all American allies looking for support in Vietnam, and the country that answered the bell the most was South Korea, that sent two divisions of troops and support forces, and so it sort of stemmed the tide of American cutback. Well, when this happened, when the Pueblo happened in 1968, I think the South Korean government saw this as a way to further reverse these efforts and even win additional support. So in the wake of the Blue House raid right before the Pueblo incident and then the Pueblo attack itself, South Korean President Park Chung-hee really went back to the United States demanding more, threatening to pull his troops out of Vietnam and warning that if the United States didn't give more, He was going to have to regroup in the South, perhaps even launch an offensive across the North, and really create political and military problems for the United States. And the United States buckled, starting in 1968, because Pak Chung-hee agreed to keep those two divisions and even was talking about sending a third division of troops in support. The United States increased dramatically its military spending. Johnson passed an emergency military appropriations program budget line for about $100 million to South Korea. They also put pressure on American government agencies to buy North, uh, not North, <laughs> to buy South Korean supplies for the military effort in Vietnam. 
And so I think the South Koreans drove a really hard bargain protesting against the American willingness to talk in Panmunjom and threatening to take action against the North that I suspect deep down they weren't really planning to take, but did it all brilliantly in order to obtain additional assistance from the United States to build up its economic and military forces. Regardless, though, of what their motives were, it proved to be an incredibly complicating issue as they demanded to be part of the Panmujan talks, which the United States refused, and then they wanted to be copied on all the telegrams and all the discussions, and the United States refused, um, and it really complicated the situation for the United States. And although I, I'm pretty critical of the American diplomatic efforts, in the end, I think they didn't have much choice here, and they actually played a pretty skillful hand. They maintained the alliance with South Korea, all it cost them was a, a $100, $150 million. They didn't let another war spring out in Korea, um, and they kept the South Korean forces fighting in Vietnam, which they really needed. In the summer of 1968, the discussion are blocked, but eventually the soldiers are returned to the United States. What happened? How was the block solved? In late 1968, there's a breakthrough. It actually beca uh, comes because one of the State Department officials, James Leonard, who was involved in the process, went home one night and really just complained to his wife that they couldn't find a resolution in 1969 and then the election was on the horizon and it would probably just be left for the next president. And his wife actually had a brilliant idea. She said, just sign the document, accept the 3A demands and publicly denounce it, publicly reject the solution and publicly state for the record that you were signing the document only to get the release of the men. And State Department official James Leonard took that back to the diplomatic community, and, and it worked. They went back to the North Koreans with a proposal that they would sign a document with the three A's on it, apologizing, admitting, and assuring, but that at virtually the same time, they would reject the document and that they would announce publicly they were signing it only to free the men. And the North Koreans jumped all over that. If we assume, as many have argued, including myself, that really what the North Koreans wanted out of this was propaganda, it worked out to be the perfect solution because North Korea was such a closed society in 1968 that the Kim family could make sure that the American denunciation of the agreement would never reach its people. And instead, they could use this signed document to distribute widely across their country um, and to other communist bloc nations as evidence that they had won, that the great bravery and determination of Kim Il-sung had forced the Americans to blink and the compromise was hailed as a great victory inside North Korea. And so this proposal was put forward, the North Koreans jumped on it, and just a, a few days or so before Christmas, the agreement was consummated, the American representative signed the agreement, another American representative denounced it almost simultaneously, and the crewmen of the Pueblo were allowed to cross into American hands and then flown back to the United States, although the Pueblo itself was never released, and, and to this day is a, a tourist attraction in Pyongyang. Did the incident of the USS Pueblo affect the U.S. Navy and intelligence in any way? Unfortunately, I, I don't think there was much of an impact. After the men were released, the Navy set up a board of inquiry, which really, I think, placed the point of the finger of blame at Commander Booker and his chief advisors. Um, I think most of the American people correctly felt that this was a search for a scapegoat, and it was. Court of inquiry, in the end, recommended a number of courts martials for... Commander Booker and some of his men, lots of letters of reprimand and other statements and policies detrimental to the career and reputation of the men of the Pueblo. The Secretary of the Navy interceded, said the men had suffered enough, and so he rejected the calls for a courts martial. Um, but by and large, I think after that, the Navy just buried it. They didn't want much public awareness of their own culpability in the process. And although Congress set up a commission to investigate that pointed pretty clearly at the failings of the American Navy, the reality is this is a time period that because of the Vietnam War, it doesn't get a lot of attention in the eyes of the American people. And so by and large, I think there are no significant lessons taken, and instead everything is just swept under the rug. The crew members were forced to sign confessions, but this did not necessarily go as the North Korean plans. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, it's almost a, a funny story if it wasn't so tragic, I suppose. The North Koreans really seemed to want out of the men were apologies and public statements of repentance that they could use for domestic propaganda. So they beat the men until they signed all of these confessions and then asked the men to start writing their own letters of apology, which not only were distributed to the North Korean people, but in many cases, uh, they forced them to send them home to the United States, to their family members and to major media outlets and to Washington officials. 
But the men soon learned that the North Koreans were pretty unfamiliar with the subtleties of the American language. And so though, although they did produce these propaganda statements, and in many cases they were really savaged in the United States by many people who thought this was a horrible betrayal and treasonous behavior that they would sign these letters admitting that they had spied and they were apologizing. In reality, the men used their greater knowledge of American language and culture to send subtle messages as part of all of these letters and apology statements. So they manipulated the language, or in some cases they, they sent letters to famous people of some controversy. They sent letters to the Dr. Reverend Hugh Hefner. Um, they sent letters to, one of them sent letters to all of his friends at St. Elizabeth's, which was a famous um, hospital for the mentally disabled in Washington, D.C., they used different language techniques. At one point, they admitted they had penetrated North Korean waters, but they used the language from the Military Code of Conduct that spelled out the exact definition of rape. Um, and in one, one of the most famous incidents, as they were preparing the next round of letters, they watched a film, a propaganda film that the North Koreans made them watch, and it was the North Korean soccer team playing in an international soccer festival in London. And when the North Korean players took the field, the London fans extended their middle finger towards them, and the North Koreans kind of bowed and, and smiled at them. And the, North, the Pueblo crewmen recognized that this meant that the North Koreans didn't know what the extended middle finger gesture meant, and so they told the North Koreans that it was a Hawaiian good luck symbol. And in many of these famous photos that went out to the American people, you can see the men with their middle finger extended. In fact, at one moment, one time, the men were forced into a press conference. And as they went outside for the press conference, the North Korean colonel overseeing it um, extended his middle finger towards them and told them, good luck, have a very successful press conference. So these sorts of things happen all the time. And in some cases, the American people got the message. And in some cases, they didn't. But the American government didn't want it to go public because they were afraid of the retribution that the North Koreans would inflict on the men if they realized they were being made fun of. And late in 1968, that's exactly what happened. As one of the crewmen sent a letter home with a photo, and uh, his uncle released the photo to the local newspaper and pointed out the extended middle finger gesture, which then appeared in a number of local newspapers, and somehow the North Koreans found it, and it launched what the men called Hell Week, a week of incredible beatings and torture that was the worst that the men had experienced. But in the end, it did go a long way to undercutting some of these North Korean propaganda efforts. Today, the U.S. Pueblo is part of an exhibition in Pyongyang, the North Korean capital. How is it presented there, and what story does North Korea tell about this ship? The Pueblo is one of the, the main tourist attractions in Pyongyang. There's an elderly gentleman in a naval outfit who leads the tours, or at least he did as of last I heard a couple years ago, who claims to have been one of the North Korean sailors who captured the ship. I, of course, have no way of knowing if that's true or not. But they present it exactly as you would think, that this was an American spy ship that was spying on the innocent nation of North Korea and had repeatedly violated their territorial waters and was captured by the overwhelming military power of North Korea. They have some of the original equipment is still on board. Some of the bullet holes are circled in, in big spray paint. And if you want in Pyongyang, you can get, I think it's a 90-minute walking tour of the ship, which is really still presented as a great victory and the embodiment of the courage and the determination of the great Kim Il-sung to defeat the American imperialist aggressors. Technically, the U.S. Pueblo is still commissioned by the U.S. Navy. To conclude, do you think it will ever be returned, and does the U.S. actually want it back? Well, the question of whether the U.S. wants it back is a great one. I know the men of the Pueblo reasonably well, and I know they want it back. And I suspect that almost everyone serving in the U.S. Navy wants it back, because it is still seen as a real black eye for the United States. Um, I suspect there are many in the higher ranks of naval intelligence and the naval community that might not want it back because it's something that's going to rekindle attention on their own failures of planning and organization that made all of this possible. In the end, I suppose the vast majority would like it back because it remains a, a, a real eyesore. It remains one of the great relics of the failures of American Cold War planning and policymaking. The question of whether or not it will ever come back I suppose it's hard to know. I've often thought that a good first step as a peace overture from North Korea would be to offer to return the ship. There have been a number of times over the past couple decades where there have been some very subtle hints from the North that they might be considering that, but it has never gone anywhere. With the way things are at the immediate moment, I don't think there's any likelihood of it happening soon. But perhaps with regime change or perhaps down the road, if there is a, a slight stabilizing of relations, it would be a good first step, perhaps, to the normalization of relations. Professor Lerner, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. 
This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.